My name is Jay. I am one of the pastors here uh, at One Life City Church. Um, and like Vanessa shared, we are um, we're starting a new series. And, and I have the privilege of kicking it off. And, and it's our series on lament. <clears throat> our lament series, um, it, it's, it's unlike any other series that we have that fills our, our Sunday preaching calendar. And our lament series, in my opinion, um, has been a powerful and transformative experience for our church community. Not because of anything flashy or creative that we do in our service. Um, Rather, it's simply that we give space for people in our community to share about their experiences, to share about their pain, to share about some of their suffering. And what we get to do uh, as as their church family is to be present to it, is to sit with it, Um, And to hold that space is sacred. And it's what we see see Jesus do over and over again in Scripture and what he calls the church to do today. And so we'll be hosting uh, different panels over the next three weeks uh, where various members of our church community will be able to share and reflect on uh, their lives and experiences in this last year uh, of of the pandemic. So there may be stories of, of pain, There may be stories of suffering, or it could be joy and celebration. Whatever may be shared in those spaces will be an opportunity for us as a community to show up and be present to their stories. Lament, for us at least, has has typically landed uh, in the season of Lent. And and if you guys uh, don't follow Lent, Lent started on March 2nd, so we're a few weeks in at least. And Lent is a season of preparation. It's the preparation for the coming of Good Friday and Easter. And if you guys don't know, Vanessa has been putting out uh, these amazing Lent devotionals. Um, My wife and I are going through them, and it has just been such a gift to us. Um, I encourage you, if you have no idea what I'm talking about, go and talk to Vanessa after service. Or if you're like, hey, I need to get on that, um, go and talk to Vanessa, and she can help you get signed up. So while I'm trying to be present to this season of Lent, and I'm starting to look towards Good Friday and Easter and all that is ahead. I'm also experiencing the sense of waiting and anticipation that's still happening. See, we're living with a lot more normalcy in our everyday lives, which is a huge relief. And at the same time, we're still in the pandemic. There are countries around this world that are experiencing new surges. And in that, for me at least, there's something that still feels unsettling in the midst of all this. So this week, um, I, I went to go uh, get a haircut. I get that like once a month, and I'm trying to push it because of rising costs. <laughs> um, and so I was chatting with a person cutting my hair, and we were just casually reflecting on current um, events, and you know, we were talking about how ridiculous gas prices were uh, on that day. Costco Fullerton was um, 5.15 for regular. Um, luckily, my, my wife's car is really small and I was driving that. <clears throat> um, but as we were chatting, she shared a comment that stuck with me. She shared how it felt like one thing after another for her ever since Kobe Bryant's death. That same day that I got my hair cut, <laughs> I saw a friend share a post on Facebook about um, it it, uh, leading up to the one-year anniversary of the Atlanta spa shootings. And so I started to reflect on how we're now experiencing uh, experiencing anniversaries of significant events um, that have been traumatizing on a pretty wide scale. And how it really has felt like one event, one thing after another, after another, after another. So I'm going to ask you to bear with me. What I did was um, I reflected back on um, some, some, for me personally, some events that just were very scarring. And, um, and I dated it. And so these are anniversary dates of significant events. We've been about three weeks and three days uh, since the start of the Russian-Ukraine war. It's been about a year and four days since the Atlanta spa shooting, where six of the eight people that were murdered were Asian American women. It's been about a year and 10 and a half weeks since
since the January 6th insurrection. It's been about a year and seven months since the civil unrest in Kenosha, Wisconsin, where two people were killed. It's been about a year and 10 months since George Floyd was murdered by police. Two years and one day since California pandemic stay at home order was issued. It's been about two years and a week since Breonna Taylor was shot and killed by police in her own apartment. For you guys, there might be um, a number of other events that come to mind you know, as you reflect back on um, what events have been significant for you. And even though they might be on, on this national scale, most likely they've also been very personal to you too. There's a lot of pain that we've experienced. All of us have had to endure loss and grief these past couple of years. And while I can confidently say that each of us were not the same person as we were two years ago, I do wonder, though, what is actually different about who we are. What's changed about who we are other than a few extra pounds, maybe uh, you know, some new wrinkles and gray hair? I'm talking about myself here. <laughs> What's the substance of that change that makes us different from who we are two years ago? And so I would ask questions like this. What's changed about how we see and engage pain and suffering? What's changed about how we see and relate to others? And what about the church? A ton of energy and a ton of resources right now are being given to doing church differently in this new era of Zoom and live streaming. But I wonder, shouldn't we be taking a hard look at what might need to change about who we are as the church, what God says of who we are, and then let that inform how we do church differently? So what's changed about how the church sees power and influence? What's changed about how the church is present to the pain that it's inflicted on others in the name of Jesus? Or will the biggest change that we see is that we now have online live streaming options? I like to suggest that how we answer the question of how we've changed depends largely on what we've done with our pain and the pain of others. See, pain isn't something I'm focused on um, simply because we're in our Lament series and and this is the topic that I need to be addressing. There has been so much strife, division, and disconnectedness these past two years. Yet the one thing, the one thing that all of us have experienced collectively is suffering and loss. And I would even argue that that has been a collective experience more than hope has itself. So in this way, our pain has, is, is, has given us this unique gift of being able to connect with one another in a way that nothing else can connect us at this time. See, our pain, it's not something to shun or hide away. <clears throat> at the same time, it's not something that we flaunt and we wave around like a banner. But in spaces of healthy relationships, we can let our pain be seen and we can accompany others in seeing their pain. See, pain can only heal when it can breathe. Our pain needs to be seen, and we need a witness to our pain. And this, friends, is where the practice of lamenting comes into play. We're going to take a look at Lamentations 3 today. And if you guys are familiar with Lamentations, you're like, oh, did Jay just pick the longest chapter in that book? 66 verses. So uh, you're welcome, Michael or Nick or Elliot, whoever's going to be doing that. And so we're going to read through it all. And it's written as poetry, so it's not as long as a read as a narrative would be. And so I have two things that I want for you guys to do as I read this. First thing is this. I want you to observe where God is in the midst of the lament. Where is God in the midst of that lament? Is God responsive? And then the second thing is this. 
You guys need to tune into this. And I know my, vo my voice is a little bit cracky today. But I want you to track the ups and the downs of the lament. And if you were to draw the ups and downs as a line, what would that line look like? So you guys ready? So Lamentations 3. I am the man who has seen affliction by the rod of the Lord's wrath. He has driven me away and made me walk in darkness rather than light. Indeed, he has turned his hand against me again and again all day long. He has made my skin and my flesh grow old and has broken my bones. He has besieged me and surrounded me with bitterness and hardship. He has made me dwell in darkness like those long dead. He has walled me in so I cannot escape. He has weighed me down with chains. Even when I call out or cry for help, he shuts out my prayer. He has barred my way with blocks of stone. He has made my paths crooked like a bear lying in wait, like a lion in hiding. He dragged me from the path and mangled me and left me without help. He drew his bow and made me the target for his arrows. He pierced my heart with arrows from his quiver. I became the laughing stock of all people. They mock me in song all day long. He has filled me with bitter herbs and given me gall to drink. He has broken my teeth with gravel. He has trampled me in the dust. I have been deprived of peace. I have forgotten what prosperity is. So I say, my splendor is gone, and all that I had hoped from the Lord, I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness of the gall. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will not wait for him. The Lord is good to those who hope, whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man to bear the yoke while he is young. Let him sit alone in silence, for the Lord has laid it on him. Let him bury his face in the dust, there may yet be hope. Let him offer his cheek to one who would strike him, and let him be filled with disgrace, for no one is cast off by the Lord forever. Though he brings grief, he will show compassion, so great is his unfailing love, for he does not willingly bring affliction or grief to anyone, to crush underfoot all prisoners in the land, to deny people their rights before the Most High, to deprive them of justice. Would not the Lord see such things? Who can speak and have it happen if the Lord has not decreed it? Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that both calamities and good things come? Why should the living complain when punished for their sins? Let us examine our ways and test them and let us return to the Lord. Let us lift up our hearts and our hands to God in heaven and say, We have sinned and rebelled and you have not forgiven. You have covered yourself with anger and pursued us. You have slain without pity. You have covered yourself with a cloud so that no prayer can get through. You have made us scum and refuse among the nations. All our enemies have opened their mouths wide against us. We have suffered terror and pitfalls, ruin and destruction. Streams of tears flow from my eyes because my people are destroyed. My eyes will flow unceasingly without relief until the Lord looks down from heaven and sees what I see brings grief to my soul because all the women of my city, those who are my enemies without cause, hunted me like a bird. They tried to end my life in a pit and threw stones at me. The waters closed over my head, and I thought I was about to perish. I called on your name, Lord, from the depths of the pit. You heard my plea. Do not close your ears to my cry for relief. You came near when I called you, and you said, Do not fear. You, Lord, took up my case. You redeem my life. Lord, you have seen the wrong done to me. Uphold my cause. You have seen the depth of their vengeance, all their plots against me. Lord, you have heard their insults, all their plots against me. When my enemies whisper and mutter against me all day long, look at them. Sitting or standing, they mock me in their songs. Pay them back for what they deserve. Lord, for what their hands have done, put a veil over their hearts and may your curse be on them. Pursue them in anger and destroy them from, the, uh, from under the heavens of the Lord. So where did we observe God's presence in this lament? If you guys can speak it out. 
What do you guys think? Where was God's presence? <laughs> How did you see God present if he was? Or was God actually responsive to that lament? Okay. One more? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> and the second question is this. How would you trace the ups and downs if you drew it as a line? What would that look like? You can just use your hands. Yeah. <laughs> right? You're doing this a lot. See, Lamentations is, is an outlier of, of a book when we compare it to all the other books of the Bible. It has a strong similarity to the book of Esther in this way. And what's unique about Esther is that God's name is not mentioned once at all. See, Esther is a story about the Jewish people who are living in exile as the people of God. Yet the entire story is told without God be, being mentioned even once. But yet, the book of the book of Esther, there's a, uh, a particularly powerful and singular theme that is communicated through the book, which is the idea of Hesed, that describe God's love. And this is just one of the themes. But Hesed, but Hesed describes God's love and his relationship with us. And what happens in the absence of God is that this theme takes front and center attention. See, Lamentations, it's a collection of laments there are five chapters of laments. And what's interesting, it's all poetic. So chapters one and two, uh, four and five, they're acrostics. At least the first two and maybe the, the fourth are. And they're only 22 verses each. So you land on chapter three, smack in the middle of lamentations, and this becomes a 66 verse lamentation, uh, lament. But here's the thing. Not once do we see God actually responding. That was actually a past tense, a reflection of, of a memory that's brought up. So in those five chapters, can't do the math, but how, however many total verses that is, God's voice is absent, just like God's name was absent in the book of Esther. So God's voice is missing. And while there are still moments of hope, right, that, that surfaced throughout, our, um, throughout the laments that we just read, what becomes noticeably highlighted in light of God's missing voice is the suffering that is expressed. And this is huge. One of the problems of, of lament, or not lament, but one of the problems, biggest problems of pain, and, and in a way I, I would offer that it's, it's the broken human nature, is that we have a tendency to want to deny. It's too much. It's too much to handle. It makes me uncomfortable. I just, I can't. And so, denial might be okay, right? If you're in crisis mode and you're trying to survive. And it's a way of coping, and that's fine. But if you harden yourself to it, if you continue to give in to a state of denial, what happens um, is that there's a desire to escape. And I don't know about you guys, but my escape has been YouTube, movie trailers, action clips, the whole gamut. My kids will be running around and, and daddy's watching some action clip over and over again because I don't want to deal with it. That's denial. That's a, that's a desire to escape. There's a desire to consume. And boy, did we consume. I'd say Amazon was probably our, our number one consumption. But that causes us to what? Avoid the pain, to deny its reality. Another one is there's a desire towards addiction, whether that's exercising, eating, um, relationship, whatever it might be. 
there's addiction that causes us to turn away from, from the reality of pain. And the last one, there's a desire towards violence. And we just act out. Because it's not for us to handle. Kathleen M. O'Connor, um, who, who wrote this book on Lamentations, that I took a lot of this from, she has this quote. But when denial becomes a hardened way of life, it inhibits human flourishing, cuts off the spirit at its roots, silences voices, and blocks passion for justice. Whether practiced by societies or individuals, denial constri uh, constricts hope, depletes life, and aborts praise. A lot of the events that I listed off um, were, were uh, racialized violence. And it just, it's not just these two years. Our, our country is historically known for violence, racialized violence. And one of the biggest arguments and, and biggest laments of those that are in peacemaking and those that are facing racism is that their pain is actually denied. So not only is their human identity as image bearers of God already denied and shut down, but when they want to speak out about their pain, that is also shut down and denied. And so in Lamentations 3, when the absence of God's voice is there, it makes it almost impossible to deny the pain that is front and center in that chapter. There's nothing else that can overshadow that pain. You're sitting in discomfort. And the reality is, until pain is seen and given space to breathe, it will not heal. Pain needs to be seen. Pain needs a witness. Here's the other issue, the problem of pain. As you guys track the ups and downs, there's nothing neat or beautiful about that necessarily. It's messy. And there were points, I don't know if you guys caught it, there were some theological points where the, the, um, the author was, was trying to reason with himself. Whether it's sin, I need to repent. Whether it's God and his uh, uh, passive, um, you know, passiveness towards, towards evil, towards suffering. All of that was him trying to reason out, okay, what's happening with this pain? And there was no answer. And that's part of the problem. It's not neatly, neatly packaged, and it can't be explained away by reasoning. And so what are you left with? You're left with wrestling with God about it. But one of the biggest issues, though, when pain is revealed in church, is that oftentimes... I wouldn't say even that church. I'd say even society in general. It's seen as weakness. In the church, it's seen as a lack of faith. In the temptation, there's a temptation towards misinterpreting that pain by those in the church. Instead of sitting with someone and accompanying them in their pain, we reject it and we deny it. And what ends up happening is that we re-traumatize that person in their pain. The other issue is that pain, it can't be willed or forced down. You can't talk it down. You can't push it down. You can't make it change. Pain, in a, in a way, as you read through Lamentations, it has a life of its own. And so what are we to do? What does Lamentations invite us to do? It opens up an embrace to that pain. It says, hey, th this is not something to deny or reject. It's a part of the reality of what we're living in. And so biblical lament, it's rooted in the hope that God will see. Like Marcos mentioned, he's holding on to the hope that God at some point, at some point, will see him, will see the suffering, will see the pain. When? Who knows? But that's the hope. And so then that person is drawn into lamenting, drawn into grieving, drawn into expressing that pain, drawn into letting out the hurt and the suffering that's been there. And so it's in that space when we embrace the pain, when biblical lament is rooted in hope that God will see, where lament actually becomes worship. There are no words. 
And so our lament, our grieving, our, our wailing, our doubting, our anger, whatever it might be, if you've been in pain and anger, you know that your emotions are everywhere. And God's saying, if you let that out to me, that is worship. That itself is worship. And what happens to, and here's how I draw that conclusion, and, and I hope you guys can kind of track with me on this. Lamentations is five chapters of lament. There are tons of lament throughout Scripture, but Lamentations is unique. At no part of those five chapters is there any praise offered up to God. There is no praise. It's only possible hope, a, a, a high point of hope. In the, down into the dark valley. But there is no praise. So why would God of heaven and earth allow and invite into this, his holy scripture, a whole book dedicated to pain? Because it's a reality. And so then, as we allow our lament to come out, as we allow our pain to surface, it leads us into worship, and it becomes our prayer. And it becomes our prayer and our talking with God. This last week, um, this is kind of explaining my, my, why my voice is a little raspy. Uh, my twins ended up catching a little bit of cold the prior week. And so on Monday, everything kind of just imploded. I goop and coughing and w what have it. And I, you know, from Monday through Friday, I was with the kids. I got a little bit of break from my mother-in-law. But by Thursday, I hit a point of dread because all three of my kids were home at this point. And where that dread moved towards was what it was like for me during the pandemic lockdown. I felt stuck. I felt helpless. I felt trapped. And my, my inability to do anything other than be stuck in that state of being. Yet what was amazing, I texted my wife, and she's like, all right, I'm going to leave right when I can go. And she's a teacher, so she, she leaves at 3.15. So when she got home, the, one of the first things that she did was, hey, babe, are you feeling like you did during the pandemic lockdown? And in that moment, healing started to happen. And I sat with it, and I've been sitting with it. And all that she did was validate and acknowledge that that pain was there. That's all that it took. And so for us, I, I have this lingering feeling that there is areas of our own lives where lament still needs to happen. And the reason why is because I believe that lament has been withheld either in our own doing or in the doing of the church or in our theological understanding of Christianity, whatever it might be, we bought into the reality that lament cannot happen because it's a lack of faith, because it's weakness, because whatever it might be. And God is saying, you cannot move forward until you let that pain come out. So what work do we need to still do in the area of lament? Maybe like me, during the pandemic lockdown, you were immersed in a space of survival. You were just trying to get through. And so you coped. You denied. You did what you could so you can make it through day after day. And while that helped you survive, it's left you limping. And so what spaces of lament might we need to enter into? How might we move forward as people of God who truly, truly see others, seeing beyond the physical, but to the hearts and stories that other people carry? How might we give space for others to lament? How might we be a community where lament is experienced as a part of our culture and a part of our belief and a part of our practice and a part of our discipleship? And what role might we each need to personally take? to help make that happen. See, here's, here's my kind of closing thought on this. Um, we cannot 
we can't, I don't believe we can truly care for those who are in pain until we become familiar with our own pain. And so then the question that's asked that, that I feel is begged is, are we willing then to let our pain breathe? See, the Lord is in our grief. The Lord is in our pain. When we lament, we worship. When we lament, we are in prayer. When we lament, we are comforted. And when we finally lament, we can be healed. And our ultimate goal is to be the people that God created us to be. Fully, beautifully, wonderfully broken, scarred, but whole. And I would absolutely deny the theology that we cannot be whole on the side of heaven. Bad theology, in my opinion. And so, what do we need to do? To let other people allow their pain to breathe, and how can we allow our own pain to breathe? I'm going to do this. I'm not going to close in prayer. Um, I'm going to offer us uh, a, a practical approach of how we can do this, especially as. Um, you know, we're, we're going into these lament panels. And um, the, the first step is to just sit with, to be present to someone. The second step is to acknowledge their pain. Just reflect it back to them. And then the third step is to sit with them in their presence. And if we can do that, I absolutely believe the Holy Spirit will do what, what needs to be done. So I'm going to invite us into a space of just sitting. Just like Lamentations, where God's voice was silent. And that pain could be um, acknowledged. I want to give us a little bit of time to just sit in silence. It's going to be awkward. Um, but it'll be okay. But sit in silence and, um, and sit with God. And, and allow yourself the grace to let your pain breathe. If that is too hard, allow yourself, whoever's with you, or those around you, for their pain to breathe. Let's just sit with that for a bit.